Now that 2020 has finally come to a close, it's time to look back on the games I played this year and make a list of my favorite games with the new 2020 games included. I want to turn this into a yearly series of sorts to look through the games I've played and see how it changes my top 10 games over the years. With all that said, let's look at the games I played in 2020. Alright, so I didn't actually get many new games this year, and the new games I got are games that actually released a long time ago. So let's start off with Dragon Quest XI S. I bought this game last year, but then I started playing it in 2020, and I really love this game. The world was great, and the cities were well designed and charming. I could pour hours easily into wandering around cities, talking to NPCs, and just exploring every part of them. I also loved digging through the menus because they were all easy to get through and there were so many things to do in there. There were so many great details to dig in and learn. Uh, I usually don't actually like turn-based combat, but I actually really liked the, the turn-based combat system used in Dragon Quest XI. I found it very intuitive, and having the option to freely roam battles helped make it less monotonous because I always had something to do with my thumbs while it wasn't my turn, and it really just made the entire experience more exciting. The game focuses on giving many chapter-like stories with simple, overarching plots that don't really combine with other plots. There is also an overarching story to the entire thing, but that's not the main focus of the game. Each story has a separate focus on a different character or a different part of the world, and it, it really sets up this next little section of a few hours that you're going to spend. Um, in the game and it really is a lot of fun to go through um, the voice acting and writing also just Lifted up this game tenfold uh, the, the the campfire scenes were so much fun uh, And all the the character dialogue was great So afterward I jumped back into Stardew Valley again Which is a game I've been playing for many years But I always come back to because it has a really special place in my heart There's always more to do and spending time in the town is insanely charming I also got back into Breath of the Wild this year. It's a game that I played on the Wii U and finished, but I think there's so much more to do that it's worth having a second playthrough, and I ended up picking it up on the Switch, which is great for when I'm traveling and I can use the handheld mode. It really kind of adds so much more to the game to be able to do that. Um, I, I, I played it different this time around. I used the Pro HUD, and I'm trying to avoid fast travel, although I did accidentally fast travel at one point. And it gave me a completely new view of the game, and you really get a better sense of the scale of the world, and it's really impressive. Uh, I'm in no rush to finish it this time. Uh, it's not my priority. I just know that I can always jump back into it for a good few hours and get invested again. So at this point, I got back into two new games, Okami and Xenoblade 2. I have actually played Xenoblade 2 before. It was the first JRPG I ever played, and it got me invested in the genre. Uh, but that was actually my biggest problem with the game, is that it's not welcome for beginners. And so when I came in, I wasn't really prepared for how much I have to grind, and how much I'd have to fight and do side quests. And it left me super over-leveled, and I would get stuck for hours on certain sections of the game, just because I had not prepared for the moment. So I decided to go back and really give this game a more of a fair chance because I loved a lot of it in my first playthrough even though there are so many frustrating moments. And the second time around when I knew what I was going to do, I loved the game way more. I became so much more fond of it. I was able to see what they were doing with some of the themes and the story, uh, both of which are absolutely superb. And the gameplay was way more smooth. I never really got stuck. I maybe got stuck a few times on bosses that are intentionally hard that you are supposed to get stuck on. But I played the game more the way that a JRPG is supposed to be played, and I got so much more out of it this time. Now, Okami is a game I've actually wanted to play for a really long time, and I finally got it on sale this year. It's a steal for $10, which is when I bought it, and it's also a steal for $20, which it normally goes for. Now, I was a bit worried because I'm not a huge fan of traditional 3D Zelda games. In fact, I've never actually finished a 3D Zelda game besides Breath of the Wild. So I don't understand why this game resonated with me so much. I mean, Amas Hirasu is great, and I grew to love Isu, and I thought he was going to be an annoying character, but he's not. The adventures are fantastic, and the art style is gorgeous, and I think that's a big reason that I stuck with the game and saw it to the end, is because I loved seeing the new locations and the new art. Everything was just visually stunning and pleasing. The game does have some pacing problems, unfortunately. One of the bosses in the game you actually have to fight three times, and the boss fight doesn't change between any of those times. It's the exact same fight, and it's a relatively long fight at that. So it could be very, very monotonous, and I was dreading the third time I had to fight the boss, because I couldn't believe I actually had to do it again. 
Uh, so it can be frustratingly repetitive with something like that. But when, when you consider the, the, the time you spend on that boss versus the time you spend in the rest of the world, you realize just how much content this game has. And the adventure goes on for a while. I spent like 40 hours in this game and it's so much fun. The Celestial Brush, brush which I was worried was going to be a kind of shoehorned in mechanic that wasn't great, was actually really fun to use. It, it it definitely did not need to be in the game, but I'm glad it was. I mean, it, it really fit in with the paint style of the game, so I, it, it, it worked well, and I'm really glad it existed. Now, at this point, I jumped back into another game that I had played back in the day, which was Rocket League, and I achieved my high strength to this point. Uh, Rocket League is a lot of fun, but I'll be honest, I'm not a huge competitive game fan. In fact, I rarely ever play them. Rocket League is the only competitive game I play. But, you know, the mechanics and stuff are a lot of fun to work through, so I'm sure I'll come back to it at some point, but I have no interest in jumping into it again right now. So then on my birthday, I used some of my, my money to get the Ace Attorney Trilogy, Dragon's Dogma, and Assassin's Creed The Rebel Collection. I'll start by talking about Ace Attorney. The games improve as they go, at least in the mechanics. The game refines the gameplay overall, and the pacing is improved generally through the games. The first game could be repetitive with boring investigations, but the twists of the case were all really great, and the writing is top tier. Justice for All streamlines the investigations a bit, but on average I don't think the cases were as good as the first. And the, I mean, the final case of that game was great, and probably the best game in the entire series but the two cases beforehand were not all too interesting. And then Trials and Tribulation comes in and absolutely perfects the gameplay and has the best cases in the entire series. The writing is epic and the cases are just so much fun to play through. You know, you never exactly know what's happening, but you figure things out and you feel smart doing it, which is something the game does great. Um, the arc overarching story as well in the third game is by far the best in the series, and I'm really glad I played these. So then I played Assassin's Creed The Rebel Collection, which is a good bit of fun. I haven't actually finished the games yet, so I won't talk too much about them, but Black Flag is well designed, and it's so much better than Assassin's Creed 3. The naval combat is great, and a great addition that's fleshed out fully here, and the story is a massive improvement. Even if some of the times I still didn't really know why I was supposed to do some of the things my character was told to do through uh, dialogue and the, the, the markers that came out. I never really understood what was happening, which could be frustrating at times, but once you sort of pick up and understand what's going on, the, the story is really enjoyable, and the, the banter is great, it's well voice act, and it's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it overall. Now, I said that I bought Dragon's Dogma, but I haven't actually started it yet, which is something I've done a lot of this year. There are a few other games that I've bought that I haven't started yet, but Dragon's Dogma is probably the biggest one, and it's the game I'm going to be playing next. Uh, so I'll talk about the final, the only actually 2020 game I purchased in 2020, which was Super Mario 3D All-Stars. I guess I didn't buy any 2020 games. So I haven't actually finished all three games yet. I mean, I completed Galaxy a long time ago, and I came back and I actually completed it again. Uh, which is so much fun. I love Galaxy. I'm well on my way through uh, Super Mario 64. I haven't started Super Mario Sunshine, uh, which I played a little bit on the GameCube. Uh, so I'm excited to look at Sunshine again because I wasn't too fond of it the first time I played it, but I'm looking forward to giving it a second chance, and it looks like it had a really good visual upgrade. Um, the, the collection overall was subpar. I mean, I think that it gets more crap than it deserves, honestly, because I think having the inclusion of the soundtracks is great, and I think the menus are nice and simple, even if there's not much to them. I don't- I wish the games weren't limited release, uh, but I don't think it's that big of a deal, because I think it's clear that the games are going to go on sale individually uh, on March 31st or after March 31st. So overall, I, I'm glad I bought this, and I'm glad I got to play Galaxy again. It's still so much fun. So with all that out of the way, I'm going to go to my top 10 games based on the games I played in 2020. Grease is one of the most stunning games I've ever played. The visuals are beautiful, the music is beautiful, I mean everything is beautiful. The game focuses on visual storytelling, and it's a massive success. Some of the scenes and set pieces are genuinely tear-jerking, and the overall narrative it tells about anxiety and depression is spectacular. The, the, it's one of those games that you can never forget about once you've played it. 
Now, I do have some problems with Greece. I do think that some of the puzzles can be monotonous or boring, but I will say that they are satisfying when you finally solve them and you keep pressing through the beautiful world. I especially love the camera that's dynamic. It will zoom out, zoom in, and it, it, it times up with the action flawlessly. I especially love the moments when the music just over t overwhelms everything and the camera zooms out to see just how small you are in comparison to the world. Fire Emblem Three Houses is a great character-driven game. I chose the Blue Lion Path, and I intend on playing the others later. Every single character has a distinctly unique personality and charm, and the voice cast gives life to them all. The first of the half of the game is filled with mystery, and the pacing is perfect to keep you on your toes and engaged. In the first week, it was the most time I have ever spent with a video game in a week's time. You can really feel the tension rising in the monastery, and everything struggling to just stay alive and stay peaceful is... You just know that something big is going to happen, and when you finally get to the end of the first half, things just explode. And the second half is a shocking change of pace. It's way slower, but I think this serves the game well because there's you're, you're trying to figure out what happened after the events of the first half of the game, and so when you're finally getting answers, you start building up an army and you start realizing exactly where you're going to have to go, how the conflict of the game is going to have to end. And I love this. I do think that having the monastery be the home base the entire time was a problem because there are so many months in the game that you will end up running through the monastery so many times and the monastery gameplay can be repetitive. But you can also choose to just skip this part of the game. You may end up a little bit under leveled, but if you know what you're doing on the chessboards, you will be able to make it through. And the, the, the final resolves of the game are fantastic. With a game that has so much happening, I expected the final cutscene to just be, like, really long. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 levels of long. But the final cutscene is only two minutes, and I realized that's all it needed to be. The ending is so wonderful and satisfying, and it's so good. Undertale has a really weird fan base, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the game is fantastic. I laughed at the beginning, cried at the end, and felt every other emotion in the middle. When some of the final threads of plot come together, it's downright shocking, maybe even disturbing. The gameplay meshes together bullet hell and RPG mechanics to make its own unique twist on like an RPG type deal, so it's really genreless. It has elements from so many different types of games that just makes it interesting and it's it's its own unique thing and I really love this game. Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I'm so glad that I gave this game a second chance to play because I was finally able to fully appreciate everything it does right, which is a lot. The combat is complex and fun and engaging, the worlds are great, the characters while I will admit that they start out sort of weak, they come into their own pretty early on, and they're fantastic for a grand majority of the game. The final resolves are incredible, but it's only incredible because everything leading up to that part was great as well. And I'd be amiss to not recognize how absolutely phenomenal this game's soundtrack is. Seriously, listen to the soundtrack. It will sell you on the game. Now here comes the section of the RPGs. This one does not have a good soundtrack. Dragon Quest XI-S. Even though it doesn't have a great soundtrack, the rest of the game is really, really good. The game oozes with polish and character. The story is structured in a drastically different way like I talked about earlier, but I really loved this style. I love that the story does not stay in one place for too long and it gives you quick little refreshers um, every time you boot up the game in case you haven't played in a long time so you know what you're doing, you don't need to search for context. Everything about this game is just polished and has so much charm. Everything is so well designed and it's so much fun to play through. Celeste combines great platforming with great writing and great music. It's the best 2D platformer I've ever played. And trust me, I've played the new Super Mario Bros. series. Every level tells a story, and every obstacle is satisfying to overcome. I was expecting some sort of cheesy story going into this, but no. The story and writing are great, and combined with the gameplay, its narrative on anxiety is near perfect. 
Every time I finished a level, I felt so much release, relief and satisfaction, and the art that it would show after every level was great. Now, I have tried my best to complete this game, but I am stuck on the Summit Seaside, and I'm totally okay with that. I, I, it's sort of satisfying to know that whenever I want to come back into this game, there's still more that I haven't seen. I haven't finished the bonus level Seaside. There's a ninth chapter now that they released, and that's awesome. There's so much more to this game that I can always come back to. Super Mario Odyssey is the Celeste of 3D platform- wait, no, that's not right. Super Mario Odyssey is the Dark Souls of 3 that's not right either. Super Mario Odyssey is the celebration of 3D platforming and Mario's history. There we go, that sounds right. Each kingdom has something special to offer, and the gameplay loop is utterly phenomenal. Odyssey has a power to surprise you with sudden twists and turns leading you to the new kingdoms and epic boss fights. I was in awe the entire time. The movement is so much fun, just jumping around the world is a blast. And that means that when you actually get into the platforming sections, it's so much fun to go through. There's not just one way to do things. And there are secrets everywhere. The game rewards you for trying to use your their, their, their controls to get to new places. And it's so much fun to be able to get somewhere and know that the developers were waiting for somebody to figure out how to get there. Wait, what? Last year I dropped Super Mario Galaxy from first to second place, and now I'm gonna move it down to number three. While this game will always hold a sweet spot in my heart, I've been able to look at it with a more critical eye having played it again. And the amazing thing is, Super Mario Galaxy still holds up. The game is brilliant. Each world has a great sense of place and atmosphere. The music is the best in the series. The platforming is great, even if games like Odyssey makes its controls feel a bit outdated. I'm stunned at how well this game holds up despite the flaws that come with age. I feel a little sad lowering this place, but I think it just comes to show that things change with time, new things can come up, and they can exceed your expectations. But I'll never forget Galaxy, it was the first game I ever played, and I will love it forever. Breath of the Wild, the Mario Killer. Breath of the Wild is masterfully designed and thematically beautiful. The game pushes the theme of loneliness and executes it flawlessly. It's hard not to be overwhelmed with emotion when you see Link on the side of a huge mountain overlooking all of Hyrule and he's alone. This helps immerse you in the, the experience, and the world is so much fun to explore. The problem with open world games in my opinion nowadays is that traversal itself is boring. But Breath of the Wild includes the paraglider and climbing mechanics, and traveling and walking is actually fun, and you can make it efficient. It's fun to find the fastest way from point A to point B. It's fun to get to the top of a cliff and glide as far as you can. It's so much fun to get from point A to point B that the world is so much more engaging. You feel compelled to explore because you know that it's not just the satisfaction of the reward, but it's going to be fun to get there as well. Now, number one, I don't know if this placement is ever going to change, but I did feel the same way about Super Mario Galaxy so long ago. But Stardew Valley is such a brilliant game, and it's one that I keep finding myself coming back to. I've become so invested in the town and my farm, and it's fun to improve things and see the community change and grow over time and being a part of that. The characters are almost perfectly written, they're wonderful, the community is great. It's a game that's always fun to just come back and relax to, and you can pour so many hours into doing that. So yeah, that's my top 10 games as of 2020. I would like to formally apologize to Okami for getting into the 11th uh, spot and not making the list. Uh, I don't know if that will change in years to come, but we'll find out. Anyway, let me you know what games you like. What would your list look like? Do you agree or disagree with my takes? And uh, let's talk about that in the comments. Thank you for watching.